Hello and welcome to this talk about preparing for remote hearings and case management in the coronavirus outbreak. My name is Declan O'Dempsey, I'm a barrister at Cloisters Chambers. This talk is aimed at helping you to make decisions on how to explain your case to the tribunal so that it understands your case from the beginning. I'm also aiming to help you to respond to orders from the tribunal or requests from the other side uh, in the case. If you can, you should try and look at this video before writing your claim or your defence. This is because COVID-19 is requiring the tribunals to make decisions on how to manage cases in a different way than before. There's going to be a greater emphasis on the tribunal taking action and then consulting with you and the other side. This will become apparent in particular when you see case management directions or orders. So that's what this talk is focusing on. There are obvious problems about trying to present a case when you can't be physically in the same room as the other participants. Online processes for remote hearings are likely to require a greater preparation of materials than has been previously done. You won't simply be able to produce things at the hearing with quite the same ease as at a physical hearing. Another aspect of remote hearing work, which is already uh, coming out, uh, is the etiquette that parties need to adopt, and indeed all the participants need to adopt towards one another. Put very simply, remote hearings are going to require a higher degree of uh, politeness and etiquette than perhaps a physical hearing uh, might require. You won't have the same cues to pick up on, and you'll need, therefore, to be conscious of the other participants in the hearing at all times, even though quite a lot of the time you won't be able to see them. However, it's not clear when online procedures will be used to conduct hearings other than very short ones or procedural ones. Hearings of any length are not currently being dealt with in this way. But the essential point to bear in mind in what follows is that the tribunal is going to be much more proactive. One of the most significant uh, changes that you'll probably notice is the difference in approach of the tribunal towards claims and issues. Once the tribunal has received the claim and the response, it'll review those documents and you're likely to get a document indicating that the judge has identified the complaints that the claimant appears to be making and listing them either in the body of the document or attached as an annex to it. So it's very important that when you're trying to set out your claim in the claim form, if you're a claimant, you should try to be very clear about what you are seeking to claim. For example, is your claim about discrimination? If so, what happened? And why do you think it's discrimination? Can you say whether it's direct or indirect discrimination, harassment or victimization? All of these concepts have a definition which is set out in the Equality Act 2010. And you can find that on the government's legislation website. You can find direct discrimination in section 13, discrimination arising from disability at section 15, indirect discrimination at section 19, failure to make reasonable adjustments at section 20, harassment in section 26, and victimization in section 27. The judge may well have mentioned some of these section numbers or referred to the concepts in the document that you get from the tribunal. But when you look at the judge's list, it's important that you think about whether the judge has got that list of issues right or not. You're going to be given a fixed period of time to indicate in writing if you disagree with the judge's analysis of what the issues are in your case. So if you do disagree, write to the tribunal and the other side in the case explaining why you disagree 
And this is a very important point because otherwise these are going to be the complaints that the tribunal will determine and you may find it difficult to bring up other issues at the final hearing. The judge is also likely to have made orders which are aimed at managing the case so that it gets to a hearing quickly and in a fit state for either a physical hearing or an electronic hearing. These orders are supposed to help all the parties to prepare the case for hearing, so take them seriously. You should note down the dates by which you must do things and make sure you do them. You must comply with the orders made in it, and if you don't, you run the risk of the tribunal striking out your claim and the tribunal may take your behaviour over compliance into consideration if a costs application is made against you by the other side. It may result in you having to pay some or all of the other party's costs, so you must comply with the orders of the tribunal. The claimant's likely to be ordered to send to the employment tribunal and to the respondent a document called a schedule of loss and this will need to be done by a specified date. It's a document that sets out how much compensation for lost earnings or other losses the claimant is claiming. But it must also show how the amount has been calculated. You must in other words show your working. This means setting out your net and gross pay per week and the period of time for which you're claiming financial loss. You must also give credit for any income which you've had, which can be said to mitigate or lessen that financial loss. Now that's a document that's called a schedule of loss, but you'll sometimes hear it referred to as a statement of remedies. You should set out uh, any recommendations that you're seeking if your claim is for discrimination, or if it's for unfair dismissal, you should uh, state if you're seeking reinstatement or re-engagement. I want to say a few words about the question of disability. If your case involves disability, there may be case management directions dealing with the question of whether the claimant is disabled. Now, very often people assume that the question of whether somebody is disabled is a complicated matter, but you shouldn't always assume this, but use common sense about it. In particular, Respondents shouldn't seek to ensure that obviously disabled claimants are put to the trouble, anxiety and expense of having to prove that they have the characteristic of disability. If there's any doubt in your mind, then have a look at the guidance and I've put the link uh, to that guidance on the slide. The Equality Act 2010 says that a person has a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term adverse impact on their ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. If you're a disabled person bringing a claim, don't assume that it's very obvious that you're a disabled person to everyone, even if it is. You should set out in your claim what your disability is and this means setting out what your impairment is, whether it has adverse effects on your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, whether those effects are more than minor or trivial, and whether those adverse effects are long-term. Now, this means that at the time of the acts of discrimination, they had lasted 12 months, or it was on the cards that they were going to last for 12 months or it was on the cards that they would last for the rest of your life. In a disability discrimination case where disability is in dispute, the tribunal is likely to make an order, along with the questions that I've just been talking about, as to what documents the claimant needs to provide to the respondent, which are relevant to the question of whether the claimant's got a disability. So you'll see an order requiring you to disclose your GP and other medical records that are relevant to the question of whether you had a disability at the relevant time. You can blank out anything that's 
obviously not relevant in those records, but otherwise you must disclose the relevant material uh, to the respondent. The other part of the order that's likely to be made is that you must disclose any other evidence that's relevant to whether you had a disability at the time. However, this order will also require the respondent to do things. If you're a respondent to a case, you're going to be ordered to write to the tribunal and the claimant by a specified date, confirming whether or not you accept that the claimant had a disability, and if so, on what dates. This is usually after you've had time to consider the materials produced in response to the order by the claimant. Once again, if there is more than one impairment, the respondent must deal with what its position is in respect of each impairment separately. So if you don't accept that the claimant had a disability on any relevant date, you need to say so and you must explain why you say that. The purpose of these orders is to make sure in disability cases that everyone's clear about the areas of dispute on that topic. And they're necessary because very often there isn't really a dispute on whether somebody's a disabled person. Sometimes respondents get confused over the question of whether the claimant is a disabled person which is what these orders are concerned about, and the question of whether they knew or could reasonably be expected to know that the claimant was a disabled person, which may be relevant to other aspects of the case. However, it's not relevant to the question of whether the person is or was at the relevant time a disabled person. So it's important if you're a respondent to keep those two points completely clear and if you accept that the claimant was a disabled person even though you didn't know it at the time it would be right to concede uh, that the claimant does have that status you can always set out your defense based on your lack of knowledge at the appropriate point the tribunal will also set out a timetable, by the end of which everyone in the case will have the documents which are relevant to the issues in the case. This is another reason why it's important to make sure that your issues are set out clearly and that the judge has analysed those issues correctly at the outset. You'll see in the order that you'll be ordered that by a specified date, the respondent must uh, send the claimant copies of all relevant documents. This obviously will have to be done electronically uh, for the moment. Likewise, by a specified date, the claimant's going to be ordered in the document to send the respondent copies of any other relevant documents. Now that includes documents relevant to financial losses, if it's an appropriate case where you can claim them such as a whistleblower case or a discrimination case, you may well be including a claim for injury to feelings. Now, although the order will refer to documents, these are not just physical pieces of paper. Documents include uh, recordings, emails, text messages, social media, and other electronic information. You must send all relevant documents you have in your possession or control even if they don't support your case. The other aspect of documents which will be dealt with in the order is the bundle or file of documents. So the concept of a bundle is something that you may hear the lawyers uh, talking about in the case. It's simply the file of documents for use by the parties in the tribunal at the hearing for which you're preparing. The tribunal will order that by a specified date, the claimant and respondent must agree which documents are going to be used at the hearings. Now, for remote hearings, if you've got physical documents, you'll need to incorporate those into an electronic bundle. So you'll need to scan them into an electronic format. PDF is probably the most useful. 
and the bundle will be a file of all such documents. Now, if the file size means that the bundle can't easily be transmitted, you should break it up into different files called Volume 1, Volume 2, etc., so that it can be sent and received more easily. Forming this file of documents is an important step. You should look at the list of issues and decide which documents are needed to prove an issue in your favour or which are relevant to the defence uh, to your uh, case. Now, each side can say which documents it wants in the bundle, but you should avoid simply putting the whole of a document in if in reality only a part of it is necessary for the tribunal to look at. Often in cases, whole policy documents are put in a bundle when neither party wants to refer to them before the tribunal. So you should avoid this where possible. If you can avoid putting in repetitious email change, uh, chains in the bundle, then this will save a huge amount of file size. What you should try to do is agree with the other side, either that only the last one in the email chain should go in, or each email should appear in the bundle so as to form a chronological bundle of documents, so it appears only once, in other words. Preparing a bundle, and especially an electronic bundle, requires a little bit of work and cooperation between the parties. The order will also indicate which of the claimant or respondent is going to be responsible for, pre for preparing the file and who is going to do the index with the page numbers. It's likely that this will be an electronic file of documents if the case is being conducted remotely. Many PDF compilation programs will insert page numbers. You may find it easier, therefore, to have a separate uh, index in a different file from the documents, because if you insert the index at the start, the function that allows you to find a page simply by putting a page number into the search engine in a reader program won't correspond to the actual page number, and that's likely to slow down a remote hearing. Here are some basics on compiling this file. Well, first of all, I mentioned you need to scan hard copy into the PDF file, but you should start the page numbering at one and go from there. Numbering shouldn't start again when there are different types of documents in a section. But there will be sections within the bundle because the tribunal will order that the claim and response forms, any changes to them or additions to them, and any relevant tribunal orders must be put at the front of the file. It's only after those that the file it should contain other documents or parts of documents that are going to be used at the hearing. These are the historical documents of events at the time and policies and so forth. You should put those in date order. You need to bring a copy of the file uh, to the hearing uh, for your own use if there's going to be a physical uh, hearing and if there's an order for a physical hearing, the order will indicate who has to provide the hard copies for the hearing. It'll also indicate how many copies need to be provided and when they'll need to be delivered to the tribunal. The claimant and respondent must prepare witness statements for use at the hearing. Everyone who's going to be a witness at the hearing, including the claimant, needs a witness statement. A witness statement is a document containing everything relevant the witness can tell the tribunal. It's important to note that witnesses will not be allowed to add to their statements unless the tribunal agrees. Witness statements should be typed if possible. They must have paragraph numbers and page numbers. They must set out events, usually in the order in which they happened, they must also include any evidence about financial losses and any other remedy that the claimant is asking for if it's the claimant's witness statement. If the witness statement refers to a document in the file, it should give the page number for that document. At the hearing, the tribunal will read the witness statements 
and witnesses may be asked questions about their statements by the other side and by the tribunal. The claimant and the respondent must send each other copies of all their witness statements by a date which is specified in the order. That's an important deadline and if the hearing is to be a physical hearing, the claimant and respondent must both bring copies of all the witness statements to the hearing for their own use. Otherwise, the electronic version will need to be sent to the tribunal in good time for the administrative staff to ensure that the allocated judge gets it. Transmitting the witness statement on the day of the hearing is unlikely to be successful as the tribunals are likely to be working with a reduced administrative capacity during the outbreak. If it's a physical hearing, the order will let you know how many hard copies you must bring. The order will say when, and if it's a physical hearing, where the hearing will be conducted, and it'll give you details of how you connect to it if it's a remote hearing. It will indicate whether the hearing will be by a judge sitting alone or with non-legal members sitting with the judge. The order will give a time estimate for the hearing, and this time estimate relates to the giving of evidence, making submissions, the time the tribunal needs for deliberation, and the time needed for delivery of judgment, and the question of remedies, if needed. If you think that more or less time will be needed for the hearing, including all of those elements, you must tell the tribunal as soon as possible. You should write to it to do so. Also, the order that you get will deal with the question of adjustments. If you need any adjustments or an interpreter, you must again write to the tribunal telling them this as soon as possible so that arrangements can be made. Finally, I want to say something about what the order will say about warnings, variations of the orders and the publicity of judgments in the tribunals. So the order will point out that if any of the tribunal's orders are not complied with, the tribunal has a variety of powers. It can waive or vary the requirement of the order. Now, if you're seeking this, you'll need to provide reasons why it should do this, or it might strike out the claim or response for non-compliance with tribunal orders. It has the power to bar or restrict participation in proceedings. In other words, you can be prevented from taking part in the proceedings. It may also, or in the alternative, uh, award costs against a party that keeps in default of its uh, orders. So those are the warnings. If you are affected by any of the orders, you can apply for it to be varied, suspended or set aside. If you're making an application of that nature, be sure to give reasons why the tribunal should do what you're asking it to do and make sure you copy the application to the other side. And that's a point that needs reinforcing. If you write to the tribunal, you must co copy the correspondence to the other parties in the case. And if you don't, the tribunal may take no action on your request because you haven't complied with the tribunal rules, which require you to write uh, to the other side or copy in the other side on your correspondence with the tribunal. Finally, a word about judgments and orders of the tribunal. The order that you'll get at the end will point out that all judgments and any written reasons for judgments are published in full online at the government's Employment Tribunal Decisions website. In effect, this means that the tribunal's judgment on the facts of what happened is likely to remain on the internet for a substantial period of time after the case. Thank you for watching.